Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich habe heute die Freude, Ladies, die Ehre und die Gentlemen, Freiheit, es ist mein großes Freude heute, to in warmly welcome you on the Climbing the Mountain event. Very warm welcome. The Foundation for Freedom, in the scope of its work, has stood up for many, many years for dialogue and equalization amongst peoples worldwide. The Armenian-Turkish dialogue is part of a regional peace dialogue that the Friedrich Nauman Foundation is working on in the Southern Caucasus. The societies are to be advised of the basic requirements for them to discuss that, to undertake the discussion course in their own cases. We've begun the political dialogue with partners in Armenia and in Turkey. With this event, Climbing the Mountain, we're daring out with the support of our partners, the Civilitas Foundation, Anadolu Kultur, and the Black Sea Trust into a literary field. The literary coming to terms with such a complex and difficult topic, such as that of the rapprochement and possibly a reconciliation between Turks and Armenians, is very fruitful for my position. Arts aspects such as identity, tradition, culture, but also pain, can be focused on in such a way as a rational political dialogue cannot. In the end, it, I'm firmly convinced Art is based on the free and personal expression of the individual and not on collective stereotypes and prejudices or even national interests, let alone. Climbing a mountain requires lots of power, force and daring and the Arab will often be surprised by the mountain with all its weathery conditions. So it's a good thing to entertain the dialogue, the process between Armenians and Turks with climbing a mountain. Mean maybe even that of the Ararat, comparing it to climbing the Ararat. So I would like to say to my partners in Anadolu Kultur and Civilitas, but also our two speakers, Fedi Hachatin and Arsene Khanjan, I would like to thank them and use this title for further events of this type. But I feel that on this hike that we are embarking upon, we need more than tolerance. Given the actual meaning of tolerare, it's more standing the other or the alien element. So this way, on this trip, we it got to have the courage not only to withstand something, but also to think into the skin, to adopt the skin of the other. But we need the freedom to disassociate ourselves from our own prejudices. Enjoy the evening, enjoy the fruitful discussion and the wonderful contributions of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much for Pamuk. Also from my side, a very warm welcome on this important event. I'm Heike McCarran, I work for an organization called the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Those of you who may have heard of our organization may be wondering what I'm doing here. Normally, we're dealing with transatlantic relations, which we're also doing here in Berlin, chiefly. Studies, conferences, think tank work, what foundations do as a rule, you know. But on top, the German Marshall Fund has a number of private-public partnerships around education, regional affairs, transnational cooperation and understanding and promoting democracy. We began many years ago. The most recent partnership is the Black Sea Trust that you've just mentioned. And we're ever so happy that together with the Black Sea Trust and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, the Civilitas Foundation, the Tagesspiegel and all other partners, we could make this important event happen. We sponsored it. The Black Sea Trust works in 11 countries. Maybe it's an interesting model, not least. It's genuinely a public transatlantic partnership. It has foundations, governments on its boards. And the thought behind it simply is that together we can achieve much more. All those that are present here, the panelists in particular, let me thank them for their commitment and their courage. I look forward to the event very much and that we as the German Marshall Fund can be amongst the sponsors. Thank you, thank you ever so much.
I would like to begin with a series of thank yous and then a series of explanations. Uh, my name is Salpi Razarian. I'm the director of the Civilitas Foundation in Yerevan. And together with me here is Jigdem Mater sitting here in the front row who represents Anatolu Kultur from Istanbul. And together we embarked on this idea uh, over a year ago, I think. And what we wanted to do was to attack this topic, tackle this topic of Armenian-Turkish relations in a different way. I want to thank the Nauman Stiftung for uh, hearing us out and agreeing to so kindly and generously host this event here today. Thank you. I also want to thank particularly the German Marshall Fund, the Black Sea Trust of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, because um, as Heike said, although usually the uh, GMF deals with transatlantic issues, they thankfully for us realize that one of the issues that needs to be tackled with in this issue of global stability and peaceful relations is better understanding and communication in the Caucasus. And I want to thank again the two of them and I want to thank all of you for coming uh, and sharing with us in this new kind of conversation that has taken about a hundred years to start. And uh, I don't think it's unfair to say that if this were five years ago Anything before five years ago, we could not have done this. Five years has become kind of the, the benchmark, the, 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 the river that we've all crossed. And, and five years ago is when Harant Dink was assassinated. Harant Dink, who in his lifetime was a leader and a lightning rod in many ways, who after his death became a cause and the leader of a cause in many ways. And that cause is better reciprocal understanding. That's simple. Had we tried to do this earlier than five years ago, we probably would have spent a great deal of time trying to um, explain genocide, convince genocide, talk whether and if. Today we're not doing that. Today we are very fortunate that there is an amazing, intelligent, thoughtful, uh, committed, passionate group of intellectuals, public intellectuals, journalists, teachers, uh, others interested in the development of human understanding even in our region. And it's wonderful in many ways that the very first such event is being held here in Berlin, where you two have crossed all sorts of Rubicons in, in history, and uh, where we can now sit and talk. We, Fethiye Çetin from Istanbul, Arsine Khanjan, uh, an Armenian from Canada, and I, uh, with you, about all of the difficult issues that face us still. What we are going to try to do in this new program called Climbing the Mountain is to try to make public the deep, complex, painful conversations that already take place in private among perhaps a hundred individuals around the world. Our, we believe that it's time to raise this to a public level, to give resonance to a different kind of dialogue, a dialogue that demonstrates that we understand that we have much to understand, that we want to understand how genocide, why genocide, and most importantly, what now? How do we go forward from where we're at now? Our idea is that we do each pair of celebrities, and we have asked celebrities to participate in this, because at the end of the day, their word uh, counts for a lot. We've asked celebrities to participate with us and to carry on this dialogue in three cities each time. We begin in a European capital, we will continue in Istanbul, and conclude in Yerevan. All of this will go up on a website that has just been developed called armeniaturkey.org. <laughs> And the hope is that there, not only will all of this be live streamed and edited and published, but also where there will be a live, active, moderated forum so that all of you can continue to participate, raise questions, raise thoughts. We will invite our guests to return to the forum occasionally with their responses and actually try to tackle the complex topics that we're going to have to deal with if there is going to be reciprocal understanding. And of course, I'm talking about two countries that don't have an open border between them. So it comes down to those of us in civil society, 
in the public limelight to carry on the conversation in order to push the processes up from below. Why a European capital? Because of many reasons. Because in both of our countries, we're striving for Europe. Because each of our peoples sees Europe both as part of our problem and part of our solution. And because it is very important for us in this process of mutual understanding that Europe not discard us or dismiss us as you know, irrational Armenians and Turks, irrational Caucasians, you know, these people will never quite manage to find ways to talk to each other. We'd like to prove that in fact we can, and what we would ask is that we invite our European colleagues to participate with us in what is really a difficult and complex discussion, and not one that can easily be resolved with, you know, get over it, forgive, forget, it's been 100 years, move on. That's not what this is. We would love to move on, and we're looking for ways to do that, and we you know, welcome your participation in that discussion. Our guests, our first guests in this series, um, are two very special people, and together they are the condensation of the Armenian-Turkish experiences. They are both political figures in their passion and their beliefs. They're both public figures. One in law, Fethiye Çetin is a human rights attorney, the other in the arts, Arsine Hanjan is a, a global actress on the stage and, and in, uh, on the screen. Uh, both hold very strong political opinions about various things and both have mixed identities that have been both forged personally and professionally by all aspects of, of their professional and personal experiences. And of course, these identities in, terms have imp uh, in turn have impacted their professional lives. I'm not sure always positively, but they'll tell us. Uh, Fethiye Chetin is, as I said, an attorney. And uh, Fethiye and I, Fethiye and Arsine, have no language in common. Uh, I don't speak Turkish, and Fethiye does not speak Tur English or Armenian. And each time we meet, we cry. If it doesn't happen in the first few minutes, it happens okay, eventually. So if it happens later today, please forgive us. This is what we do. And uh, to prove that that's how it is today, when Fethiye and Arsine first met for the first time, they too cried. Um, and often it's all for the same reasons, which is what's amazing, is that we go through the same sets of memories and we find that we can share them with each other in ways that we often can't share with others. And when we've dis discovering that itself brings on the tears, so bear with us, join us. Fethiye Chetin is also a former political prisoner. And when I talk about political convictions, I'm talking about people who, you know, put their mouths where their beliefs are. She's also a member of a whole new Turkish subcategory. Perhaps two million Turks who are discovering slowly that somewhere they may have an Armenian ancestor, as Fethiye Çetin did in um, talking with her grandmother prior to her grandmother's death. And of course, that story is now called My Grandmother and appears in various languages, including outside, available for you to purchase. And I suspect Fethiye may even autograph them. Arsine Khanjan is a grandchild of survivors, born in Lebanon, uh, raised in Canada, which makes her as polyglot and multicultural as you can get, because she comes from the multicultural capital of the Middle East and goes to the multicultural world of Canada. Um, Canadian, intercultural, inclusive, uh, worked in multicultural, intercultural environments in Canada, is an actress uh, with global reach and has been both a muse and a mentor to others in the arts world who have tried to meld their various backgrounds. We're going to conduct this conversation today, as I said, after about 100 years of silence, and uh, ask you each to ignore me whenever you wish and just talk amongst yourselves. You know, we'll all listen. Um, but maybe start. Uh, Fethiye, maybe you tell us why you're here in this personal journey of yours that has been so fraught with both personal and professional challenges, too mild a word. Why, why are you here? How are you here and why are you here? And thank you for being here. I'm very excited. I'm sorry for my excitement. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Stiftung and all the partners who made this event possible. Arsene came uh, quite a, 
a long way from here and I would like to thank you for coming yes. and also I would like yeah, to thank Salpi. Yeah. Yes, how did I end up here? In the eastern part of Turkey, we have a city called Elazığ. I was born in a small town and I was born into a family who identifies itself as a Muslim family. And then I went to school and in school we are taught a history whereby we learned a Turkish nation in the past undersigned great victories and we created great heroes. Yet, we are all surrounded by enemies all over the place. And since we are all surrounded by enemies, we all need to be very cautious and careful. But at that time, we did not hear about Armenians uh, amongst those enemies. And we did not hear anything about 1915. And we were all very much impressed with this victorious History, for instance, me, my, I myself, I was very good at uh, citing poems. I was very good at reading poems. You know, I was going out and I was reading very enthusiastically all these heroic poems. You know, they were all praising heroes and they were full of pride and they were even praising uh, militarism. And one day, uh, I was uh, almost an adult. By that time, I heard a different story from my grandmother. She made me sit by her side, and I never forget when she was telling me about the story, she was always, you know, having this, this gesture on the skirt. She was telling me her story, but on the other hand, she was just uh, swiping off all the bad memories, everything, all the pile up, because she was living with this burden, and when she was telling me all these stories, she was simply uh, cleaning them out. So when I heard all these stories, I was truly shocked. I mean, if she had not been my own grandmother, I would perhaps not really believe in her. That was for the first time in my life. But then I realized that in my lifetime there were so many things that I have not realized before. And everything, in a way, was confirming what my grandmother said. Stones, ruins, stories, names, everything was confirming what my grandmother said. So when I learned about this story, I was studying law in university. I was a dissident. I got to know uh, socialist ideas in Turkey. I mean, in Turkey, I was struggling against a country which was not democratic. I was a woman, and I was trying to, you know, uh, make myself heard in a patriarchal uh, society. So I already started climbing as a woman uh, in a male-dominated circle, and I was trying to become a female lawyer, again, in the male-dominated profession. But now I got to know a new identity of mine. And again, I had to struggle for that because we had enormous taboo and silence. I mean, I would never ever imagine that this taboo and silence would ever be uh, broken. And I also thought that I had to struggle for my identity. And I started climbing this mountain. Little by little climbing. But what I wanted to do is to make sure that I have all my identities protected as a lawyer, as a woman. I always had to struggle with other people, with the outside world. But now, when I found out about my grandmother's identity, I also had to struggle in my inner world. So I had to go climb up to the top of the mountain, and I had to keep and strike an inner balance. What was it? Well, when I heard this for the first time, my first reaction was, yes, they lied to us. So I was feeling anger. 
I was outraged. And I was so outraged that I wanted to go out to the street and scream at the top of my lung. And the second reaction, the second feeling, was a shame, a great shame. I was so ashamed of what people, human beings, did to others. I didn't know rest of my family, were they perpetrators? Did they keep their silence when the real perpetrators were committing this crime? And where do I stand? I mean, who I am? Where shall I stand? So I had this inner struggle, this inner fight. And then I decided to do the following when I was very young. As much as possible, I ignored the groups that I thought they were perpetrators. For instance, they were asking me, who are you? What are you? And I was telling them, I'm, I'm like a hybrid. I'm mixed. I'm not letting them know anything. I didn't want to show myself as if I'm close to one group or the other, one identity or the other. And at some point, I came to realize the following. My family, they were really very poor. I mean, I come from a very poor family. My grandfather was a poor man, and my uh, paternal grandfather was also very poor. So then I tried to convince myself that, okay, they were so poor, so they can't possibly be perpetrators, you know? It's really good that we are poor. Because 1915, what happened in 1915 and afterwards, there was this ethnic cleansing and Armenians, Greeks. I mean, for many years, they created lots of valuable things. And after 1915, I mean, all these assets were given to people and who became very rich afterwards. So that's how I was comforting my own conscience. But what happened to me? I mean, was I able to make peace with myself? No, because my grandfather was of Turkmen origin, so I also had to make peace with that. And I was carefully making a balance in my mind by telling myself that I am hybrid. I have a hybrid identity, so once I accepted and acknowledged my hybrid identity, then that was the time when I made peace with myself, and I believe uh, I really made a very good progress on climbing. And of course, I was uh, in the prison, then I had the book, and today, finally, here I am. And this was a great responsibility for me. I had to do it. And now I really feel that I'm here with you. And I'm here at this point. Thank you. Arsine Khanjian is um, the grandchild of genocide survivors who, uh, you know, as any who live in diaspora know from anywhere, from any ethnicity, means that she's living many lives at the same time. And in her case, with the art world before her, she took the risk of bringing this sensitive, that's an understatement, this difficult, complex, uh, topic to the screen, I would say probably at great professional risk, if not expense. Um, but you're here, you did it. How did you get here? And I'm glad you're here. I'm very happy to be here as well. And I, I think uh, even, as you said, five years ago, uh, I wouldn't have imagined that uh, this kind of um, conversation, uh, that the conversation would happen, uh, that's not the issue, but that I would take part in this kind of conversation. And uh, the reason I'm here, it's uh, actually much less so about uh, my own uh, exploration of uh, a past that I know very clearly about. Um, I have had from my birth, from the moment I was born into this world, uh, 
a multiple identity reality. I was born in Lebanon from uh, uh, a family, uh, from parents who were themselves born in Lebanon because of my grandparents' uh, 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 deportation through Syria and then eventually to Lebanon as orphans. I lived in a, a Arab country, in a Christian Muslim Arab country. Then when the civil war started in Lebanon, we had to migrate to Canada. And uh, I found myself at the age of 17 uh, in one of the most multicultural countries in the world, if not the most multicultural country in the world, where I was not any longer uh, so, uh, sort of trying to uh, hold on to my own culture, I realized that many other people in my adopted country of Canada, uh, a lot of people were trying to hold on to their own histories from wherever they came from. So uh, this was a fortunate experience, accident in my life somehow to end up in Canada. I owe a lot to the Canadian society, to the Canadian uh, culture, to the country itself, the institutions, the political institutions, the cultural institutions, uh, because they taught me what it means to be a person with multiple identities. They allowed me the room, they, to, they allowed me the, the space, they allowed me the freedom to explore these questions. Uh, I did not have the experience that Fatia had uh, in terms of uh, being lied to. Uh, I did come uh, from a very specific background because until the age of 17 I was in Beirut and I went to Armenian school, I went to Armenian church, all my friends were Armenian, I was not allowed necessarily to be with non-Armenians, Christians or Muslims alike, because we had a very clear mission as survivors, third generation of the genocide, which was the one of preserving the culture through the language, through the traditions, uh, through the history. So I think this particular very strong uh, formation of mine uh, came down to one simple issue. It was the issue of justice. I think from the first day uh, of acquiring this sense of uh, uh, individual in society, I realized that all my upbringing was about learning what is the nature of justice in society and that justice is something that can uh, ultimately be found wherever under the most oppressive uh, circumstances or on, in the most liberal, open societies, as long as individuals take on that responsibility to, to seek justice. So in a way, uh, I think my work was eventually my personal choice, which was the one of investing my interest in the arts, was infused very much with my also upbringing, the one of per pursuing truth and justice about who we are and uh, our history in that sense. Um, I come from a country uh, as a Canadian, and I do call myself a uh, Canadian without any hesitation. Uh, I'm a Canadian of Armenian uh, descent, uh, and I come from a country where we had a history of genocide, uh, very interestingly addressed in terms of the Aboriginal people of Canada and in 2008, the Canadian government very truthfully and very courageously, I may say, uh, made that commitment to apologize for all the wrongs that they had committed historically uh, towards the Aboriginal people. This is not the case necessarily in the United States, for instance. Uh, I come also from a country where the Armenian genocide has also been recognized at all level of governments and all level of governmental institutions. So as far as I'm concerned, I am here today not to at all defend or argue for or prove to you, any one of you, who may or may not know the history of uh, the genocide uh, that was committed by the Ottoman Turks in 1915 against their own Armenian population, minority population, but major minority population who were living on their ancestral historic lands. 
I'm not here to try to argue any of those things because I am very much convinced and I have all reason to know that this history is true. I am here uh, because Salpi Ghazarian actually convinced me that it would be a very interesting opportunity to speak with all the possible Turks today who live in Turkey, in their homeland, and who are starting to have major questions about their own identity in terms of finding out that maybe there is a grandmother and it seems that often it's a grandmother. Sometimes it's a grandfather, but it's often a grandmother. Being on the Kurdish side, being on the Turkish side, the grandmothers are or were, because probably a lot of them are dead now, were Armenian. And this question spoke to me very closely because I suddenly felt that all the political work that I have been trying to uh, pursue all these years, and in a way, I, if I may disagree with you, Salpi, it's not that we, for 100 years, did not try to dialogue. I think as Armenians, we tried to dialogue, but there was no way to dialogue. There was uh, no one on the other side. There was no one on the other side to dialogue with. Uh, the same way the border on the Armenian side is open towards Turkey, but the border on Turkish side is closed towards uh, to Armenia. I mean, geographically, I mean literally, I don't mean metaphorically here. So uh, we tried different things. Sometimes we did mistakes. Uh, most of the time, we tried very hard to involve the international community, the European Union uh, community. And uh, as you would know, realpolitik came in the way, and realpolitik took uh, the sort of the priority on how this issue of the genocide was going to be resolved. As I was witnessing myself all of this, and raising questions about who I am, what should I do, what is my identity, uh, and what is my responsibility, I realized over the years that the question was a very simple one. As long as Turkish citizens, the Turkish society, the civil society, the Turkish institutions, Turkey in general, does not raise this question from within itself, within its own parameters of history, we can only do so much. And the fact that either Europe or North America or the international community in general, because politically they were not willing to take a stand a lot of the time, it came to my mind that really this question of the Armenian genocide seems to be only the surface of a much deeper problem that exists in Turkey today as we speak. You do all know about the Kurdish situation in Turkey. You may not know about the Armenian history, but you do know what has, what's, has been happening or what still happens as we speak in Turkey, uh, the Kurds and all the other minorities. Uh, so when I heard that there were, especially after the assassination of uh, Haran Dink, that uh, there were a very significant number of Turkish citizens who were ready to say to themselves, not to me, <laughs> to themselves, what is this history? What kind of uh, regime are we living under? And why is it that the world tells us something about us that we don't seem to know. How is this possible? Okay, the Armenians are shouting in one corner or, or many corners in the world, but why is it that others also are referring to this? So what is this history about? So within the civil society in Turkey, this change started happening. And this change, along with now so many uh, testimonies, it seems, where the question of an Armenian identity, quarter, half, uh, I don't know, it's like how do we measure these things, but I mean, the question that there are two million Armenian souls in Turkey, what do we do with this? And as an Armenian from the diaspora, uh, who has never been to Turkey really, well, I have climbed the mountain. I have physically climbed the mountain. She has. 
<laughs> and the, the mountain one. <laughs> for me is very clear. The mountain is Ararat. It's not any other mountain. Uh, for us Armenians, when you say climbing the mountain or you say the mountain, the mountain is Ararat, which doesn't exist in Armenian territory, but we see it from Yerevan every day. So, um, the, uh, so the question was to me to find out about a quarter of a sister that I seem to have in Turkey. I want to know about what she feels, finding out that she comes from both, as you said, a perpetrator and a victim reality. Uh, I don't consider myself as a victim anymore. I have resolved these issues, but I do seek uh, justice. But it seems like there is a new development in Turkey in terms of a, a history that some of us are saying, well, forget it. Well, hold on, how can we forget it? It's just starting for Fatiye. It's just starting history for Fatiye. And your history is what I'm going to be part of, it seems, because we're going to have to start talking to see how we can compare notes. So I'm here for that today. Fethiye, you, I think a lot of what Arsina says, the frustration, the anger, and then the internal resolution is a process that many Armenians have gone through. You have gone through an exceptional sort of process. You and your, my, our friends, whom I call the personal and professional friends of Ranting. What do you want from Arsine? What do you need from Arsine? What can the Arsines of the world, the Armenian world, the global world, do for the Fethiyas of Turkey to move this forward? Well, as Arsine said, well, there is no doubt we first have to talk about this issue. But for many years, we were not able to talk about it. And we are all now looking for ways how we can normalize this type of conversation. And talking, and all these talks, and all these debates and discussions, there were some theori theoretical discussions, there were some political debates, there were the number of people who were killed, who died, and how are we going to name what happened in 1915. So there were all these political discussions, but they did not carry a human aspect, they did not carry a human face. So let's start by discussing people, human beings, and their pain and suffering, because this pain was suffered by people. So that was our starting point. That's how we started this journey. We started talking about human stories, and then we had some sort of an explosion. Once I made it public, then I got so many people around me saying that, well, actually, my grandmother is like this. And I have this in my family. So now, in the public sphere, there are so many people who are talking about it, who are publishing books about it. So in this respect, we really have a very positive climate. But on the other hand, I observed the following. Maybe there are hundreds of thousands children, like my grandmother. They were converted to Islam. They were Muslimized. And starting from the third generation, all memories, they were about to be completely erased. There was an incredible silence in the third generation, and it was not really possible to talk about this truth. And it was also not really possible for these women to go out in public and say, well, this is my personal story. They couldn't make it. So when I discovered this, of course, I shared it with my Armenian friends. And I asked them questions. What do you know about this? Do you know how many people are there in Turkey, like my grandmother, who were converted to Muslim and who had to just keep their silence until they're dead. And no one had any idea, neither in Turkey nor in the diaspora. I'm talking about my Armenian friends. They had no clue. 
And people like my grandmother, you know, all these grandmothers and grandfathers, they were simply ignored. They were somehow declared null and void. You know, Turkey. Has its own ideology. It's extremely nationalistic, and I can understand this, you know, because we have this nationalistic ideology. It's the official discourse, and it denies things, and there is the silence. But I found it very striking that Armenians are also silent on that. And once I got to realize this, I thought it would be a good idea to start talking about the survivors who had to convert and I also believe that this would be a kind of a, a tie that would uh, put us together and this process just proved it to be true and I also found something very interesting you know that there is this uh, UN uh, convention uh, about genocide dated to dated back to 1948 and there is a very important element uh, one of the articles say that if uh, some children are given to other ethnic groups and they are forced uh, to change their identities, this is also one element that makes this constitute genocide. So this is a very important discussion from the legal point of view. But I also realized that this was not also debated. Well, I guess like both parties had some issues when it comes to talking. And then I believe that now, at least in Turkey, these things are much easier. Uh, when, when you say uh, that the uh, Armenians uh, don't know or, or didn't uh, necessarily help you out with the answer that you were looking for, well, uh, couple of things. Uh, Armenians came out of the trauma of the genocide. Uh, we talk about a million and a half, give and take. Uh, I think what they tried to do was to simply survive as best as they can. And it's only basically by my generation where we started asking the questions. We could allow ourselves, because economically we could uh, sort of feel that it was not only about uh, feeding ourselves or finding a host country to take to in, uh, to um, uh, welcome us. So we established enough ourselves as just plain human beings, and also uh, the distance of time, and and also the distance of time, of course. But we got also the education, and we got all the uh, possibilities of creating context. Now we had no access to any history that we were trying to reach out, as we know, to find out what happened to any Armenian if there were any Armenians left. As far as I'm concerned, until a few years ago, I didn't even know that there were the Hamshensi Armenians, for instance. Those so, who live along the Black Sea coast who were Muslimized and speak their own dialect of Armenian, Turkish, and, and this is before there, 1915. This, they they were Muslimized under pressure. Years. So we're talking about a pattern of oppressions in the Ottoman times and later on with the Republic that came and eliminated, eliminated the idea of minorities so that it creates Turkishness. So I did not, we did not have any access to be able to quantify, to look for, to search for. Uh, in the case of the Holocaust, for instance, there were possibilities of access to archives. We had no access to archives. We had no access to uh, any reasonable information so we can give an answer to a question like yours. So uh, this is one thing. The other thing is when you say that you find, when you find out about your Armenian uh, uh, family history, uh, and that, you know, this idea of talking about it and who to talk about it. You do know, Fatia, better than I do, that to say that you're an Armenian in Turkey today is still a big problem. It's not an easy thing. You were courageous. 
You used the word courage earlier. It doesn't apply to me. I'm not courageous to be here today. But you are courageous for having written the book and stating very clearly what your uh, discovery is and what your pursuit has been since in terms of your identity in that, and your history in that sense. Uh, to, j just to say that uh, just a little while ago, uh, President uh, Gül was uh, accused because he supported the apology of few uh, Turkish uh, intellectuals as freedom of speech, uh, so the apology to the general idea, there was no mention of genocide, but whatever had happened historically. So when the, the president of the republic says, that's okay, it's freedom of speech, he is accused of being Armenian. Now, he gets very upset, and he brings the person to court saying, you're insulting me by calling me Armenian. This is the reality. So, I mean, you cannot easily say that you're Armenian because you're afraid of the consequences. So if your grandmother didn't bring up, then your mother, who is half Armenian, effectively would not talk about it. There are real fear. There is real fear in the, in the present day society of Turkey of being Armenian. It's a problem. Can you imagine that in Germany? I can't imagine that in Canada. I cannot imagine that actually pretty much anywhere in any country that calls itself democratic. So here is a very real issue that you're dealing with. If it's shameful to be Armenian, if that's, it's a curse it. or it's an the insult, then how do you work towards that identity? I would, I would like to know that. And the shame at various levels, huh? The shame of having been Muslimized, the shame of not knowing your roots, the shame of knowing who you are and not being able to say something about it, the shame and the guilt, and maybe the courage comes from, as you said yourself at the beginning, overcoming the shame and the guilt. That's where your courage came from, is by overcoming shame, guilt, and perhaps that's something that both ends, huh? the, the, the children of the victims, the survivors, are going to have to deal with, because there is shame and guilt involved there still in trying to not deal with the, the pain of the past, not you know put aside the grandmothers and the grandfather stories, and there's the shame and the guilt among those who are dealing with these issues today. Is, is that how we get to courage, by getting past the shame and the guilt? And at the end of the day, does it matter? The number of people who said to me, and don't tell the German Marshall Fund, the number of people who said to me, you're wasting time and money doing this, because really, at the end of the day, all of this is just feel good. You know, we feel good, we're commiserating that Lemish and Turkish and Armenian, I don't know anymore. You know, we're, we're sharing our pain, and at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because the decisions are taken elsewhere by other people. Shame, guilt, courage, impact. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you both, because you really praised me well, but in Turkey we have so many courageous people. Let me give you an example, so that you will see how I approach this issue. Well, when I was young, I defined myself as a socialist, and I was in a struggle against the state and the system, and we were even dreaming of changing the entire world. And we had a coup d'etat, a military coup d'etat in Turkey, and they rounded up us, all of us, and they took us to the police department, they tortured us, and then we were sent to the prison. And we were lots of young uh, women in the ward, in the prison ward, and they were not scared at all. They were not scared at all to change Turkey or to change the world. There were plenty of young women ended up in the prison. And, of course, in the prison, almost every day we were being beaten up and we were subject to torture. And we were forced to show some uh, military action, but we were resisting. And one day, in the prison ward, I shared the story of my grandmother. 
And then I realized the following. By the way, we don't have anybody else listening to us, you know. We are just all alone, the prisoners in the world. But we were whispering to each other. There was no one listening to us. But then why we were whispering to us? Why on earth we were whispering and not talking in a normal tone? Because we were still keeping our silence. We were still hesitating. You know, we are those courageous women who are very loud normally, but we were whispering. Angola. I mean, there are so many women, like in, in Chile, in Angola, many young women. I mean, we were so much informed about what was happening in these countries, in, like in Chile or in Angola, but we were totally clueless about what was happening in our history. So, I mean, you can't simply explain this by fear. I mean, we didn't know about our grandmother's stories. So, yes, there is this fear, there is this silence, which is internalized silence. On the one hand, you have a very serious uh, enmity discourse. I mean, and the word Armenian is perceived as an insult. It's like a swear word. Let me just tell you a recent experience. In the summertime, I visited my grandmother's village, and there was an Armenian, a young Armenian next to me, and they were introducing this Armenian uh, young person to the villagers. And they said, okay, by the way, this is Armenian. And then we got the reaction as following. Ah, you call this person Armenian and he is not angry with you because you call him Armenian. So yes, we are really different. But I came to realize the following. The moment we come together, everything changes because we really like talking and at the same time touching each other, like physically touching. And the moment we start talking, all these prejudices are disappearing. So all these individuals, I mean, all of us, we're all individuals making up the society. So what do I expect? Yes, well, the governments, they apologize. But the real change comes with the individuals, all these individuals who make up the Turkish society. If they hear this, if they hear this right in their conscience, this will be the, the real significant thing. I mean, if people don't feel this in their conscience, then I mean the governments may apologize, but we can always live the same thing. So if you ask for my expectation, I say the following, let us touch one another as people, as individuals, as societies. Of course, this will also have some political repercussions and our personal interaction will also accelerate and speed up all these political processes because Today, in my current capacity, this is the only thing I can do. But I mean, if we continue like that, maybe we can just take this discussion to other platforms. And, and let us never forget about the official ideology in Turkey. Now people are talking and the official uh, ideology uh, makers are really afraid of this. And you have taken it to another platform, you each have. You each took your pain, your anger, your frustration. Um, Arsine, you did it with Ararad and tried to get that message and the pain out to a bigger world. And Fethiye, you did it not just with the book, but this last summer in June, you renovated fountains in your grandmother's village Found, uh, in a village that is today Turks and Kurds, and you made it possible, you made it possible for you to go back. You made that possible, not only for you to go back, for others to go back with you and to say, you know what, I am also a part of this, this is also mine. I may have been erased from the list for 50, 40, 60, 80, 90 years, but this is mine and I am a part of it in a positive way. 
that's my take on what you did. It's my take that Ararat was, you know, the, the consequence of anger, frustration, and wanting to turn this into something bigger. What is, you tell us, why did you do what you did in Havav? You renovated fountains for Pete's sake. You could have done, you know, other things, but it, water fountains in a village, why did you do that? I had never been to my grandmother's village beforehand. It's in Armenian, it's Havav. It's Havav in Turkish, and it's in Polo district. So what happened is that I published my book about my grandmother, and then people from this village, they called me. And then I visited the village afterwards. And I was always trying to find out some ways how we can facilitate coming to terms with the past, talking with the past, talking about the past. I mean, how we can actually talk about the past based upon all the remnants of the past, like the stones, for instance. Because if when while doing so, we don't blame one another. We don't just blame each other. Because first, we start discussing, like, who built these fountains in the first place, who were using these fountains, who were drinking water from these fountains. And while doing so, like, during the restoration process, we wanted to work with volunteers, Armenian, Turkish, Kurdish volunteers. We wanted all these volunteers to come to the village. So, last year, I spent four months in the village during the restoration. And yeah. we did this together with Ranting Foundation. We got lots of volunteers, again, Armenians, Kurds, Turks, and they work with the villagers. And of course, in the beginning, they faced lots of prejudice. And also, like some people outside the village, they were also feeling some hostility, injecting some hostile feelings to the villagers. And I'm not exaggerating, because I also heard this from some other people. I saw the transformation in people with my own eyes. And this was a very important experience. And now the waters from these fountains are flowing again. And we're drinking water from these fountains altogether. And once we launched the fountains again, for the villagers, they took all their carpets and they started washing their carpets by the fountains, just like my grandmother, just like my grandmother's parents and their friends used to do in the past, a century ago. And when they were drinking water from these fountains, they were praying for the soul of all these people who initially constructed those fountains. This reason why we did it. Because it's about dialogue. It's about touching one another and metaphorically, like just making sure that these dried up fountains can be working fountains as well whereby we have water flowing again. That was the idea, and Salpi was also with us. She came uh, to see uh, the festival we organized after the restoration process. Some days ago, my friend told me that uh, one of the villages, uh, they made uh, an application. They wanted uh, a church in their village to be restored. I mean, if uh, all these fountains are being restored, then we also want this church to be restored, and they want to apply to the Ministry of Culture. Because we're not talking about destruction of Armenians. We're not only talking about destruction of people, we're also talking about destruction of all traces. You had the churches, you had the fountains, the houses, all traces. They tried to erase all these traces, and we tried to uh, retrieve those traces and take care of them. And maybe through this way, we can come to terms with our past. Arsine, you and well, uh, Atom Megoyan and Ararad, you did <laughs> the same thing. You took uh, people's pain to millions of people, and uh, you tr did it in an unusual way, perhaps expected given your world, but in an unusual way. And 
the, the results, the impact of that is still there. People who thought the genocide in Armenia and Turkey were not their topic uh, have, were and are still touched by what you did. Why did you do it? I said anger, frustration, message. You know, um, as I'm listening to Fethi uh, uh, explain the symbolism of the fountains, um, I become almost envious and uh, also very sad that uh, at one level there is something as beautiful as the symbol of what you have done. On the other hand, there is still a very deep, profound, and worrisome reality, which is the one of denying the existence of this history everywhere on, in, this huge, in this huge country that is Turkey. I would like to be able to go also to the village or the city where my grandparents came from. I wouldn't know where that would be. And that's not because I don't know. It's because it's impossible for me to find out. It's because that is a question for me that I can, I'm not allowed to raise while in Turkey. I can raise the question here to you, with you, uh, but I'm not talking about theoretical question here. I'm talking about a physical question, which is the one of uh, reviving fountains that flow. I think it was Haran Dink, I know that it was Haran Dink who said something beautiful, but I'm gonna paraphrase it. When he was trying to argue about his belonging to the land, when he said that his blood runs under the the, the earth of this country. My blood does also run under the earth of that country. And the extended family of my grandparents left their blood soaked in that country. I would like to know where those places are. I cannot. I cannot because um, the moment I ask for that, I am suddenly put into a, a, a category of vengeful and unforgiving and uh, irrational, emotional uh, diasporan Armenian. And this is not, by the way, only an expression of uh, institutions in Turkey or the, the Turkish state. There are a lot of European uh, governments or institutions who also look the matter the same way. So when we made Ararat, it was very clear that we were talking about a very major problem that is a plague in Turkey today, and this is the problem of denial. Denial of history, denial of uh, accepting the reality of what the Turkish society is about, the denial of uh, freedom to Turkish citizens of any background, cultural background, you know, I can name it and you will complete that between the Alewis and uh, you know the Arabs, uh, the Kurds, and uh, my God, please help me out. Wow. The, the, all, of, all of them are today living in Turkey. Do they have the possibility of going to fountains and bring water to those fountains? I'm not sure that is the case because the denial is such that if you confront it, there is an incredible fear. So how does huge society of 80 million, pretty much 77 million people who generally are feeling fear, how can they revisit their reality and their history? So in an odd way, you are 100 years late to find out about your own history, when for 100 years I have been trying to understand why it is so difficult to go back to the fountain and wash my hands in that fountain. I cannot access that. When I went to Ararat, 
a couple of years ago. Uh, it was one of the most uh, terrifying journeys in a way because I had understood all throughout my, my life that we have lost not only our culture, not only human lives, not only our families and our ancestors. I, I don't know. I don't know who these people were. I cannot find out for the life of me more than my grandparents as survivors of seven, eight-year-old uh, children. So when I went to Ararat, I was in historic Armenia. I looked at the land and I thought, oh, so this is what it was about. All the references to uh, this paradise that we had and we lost. But when I was climbing Ararat, something really strange happened. Talking to the Kurds, who were our coaches, uh, the guides, because you can't just climb Ararat, it's just rocks, and you have to know your ways, and your way, and there are no ways. The Kurds know very well that region, because now the whole entire region is an inhabited by, Tur by Kurds. They would come and tell me, like very proudly, very happily, you know my grandmother was Armenian. And I think, they were very disappointed at my reaction because they expected that I was going to be happy that there was this connection between them and me. And then I felt very awkward because I thought, I thought mm, I'm, I'm doing something wrong, but wh why is it that this is like so uncomfortable? And of course I realized that any Kurd a Kurdish person who comes and tells me that their grandmother was Armenian doesn't rejoice me, doesn't make me happy, because the circumstances of those grandmothers to be Armenian were the very much the proof of what we have lost. So at one point when this kept happening, I mean, at least eight, nine people came to me, the guides and people living there, you know, I said, so are you Armenian? And this was not the right question to ask. They said, no, I'm Kurdish. I said, so why are you telling him that your grandmother is Armenian? What, what, what are you expecting me to say? Because for me, when you say that, it makes me feel like crying that your grandmother is Armenian. Before the genocide, these communities coexisted in geographies that they shared. But there were no culture. One was Muslim, the other was Christian. They lived in their own realities, in their own customs, traditions. They respected more or less each other's traditions. But marriage was not uh, a common practice. So obviously, these grandmothers didn't end up being in those marriages and didn't end up being grandmothers to these children out of their own volition. Later on, as we were climbing the mountain, we were 10, and nine of us were men. I was the only woman. Uh, we were all kind of in this kind of ecstatic state, probably. We were singing Armenian folk songs and, uh, you know, things like that. And I realized that our two guides, they started singing in Kurdish, but not the songs that we were singing. They were singing their own songs of their own. And suddenly it became this very tense situation where we were singing in Armenian, claiming somehow a past that we don't have anymore. And these guides were making sure that we understand that there is no access to that past, even with a song, because now that land is Kurdistan. So, this is to say that the beauty of what you're describing is something that exists thanks to your efforts, but what I'm hoping through this conversation today is that many other instances are gonna be created following your example, because just the fact that this exists right now is maybe on a positive note, maybe, 100 years later, starting point. But it certainly doesn't, for me, resolve the question of not being able to access my past other than still analyzing it. I have no, 
a connection otherwise. I can analyze my history, I can read history books, I can go into documents, I can do all kinds of rational things, but I cannot taste the water because the water is now called something else. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and I have a choice. I can either open it up to you or I can let them continue and tell one more story each and then ask you each to put your questions on the Armenia Turkey site and they will answer them on Thursday in Istanbul and you can watch the live stream then. So you have a choice. If anyone is dying to ask a question, please tell me. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to Fethiye. Fethiye. I do, before I go back to Fethiye, I just want to make a point that perhaps is obvious and I apologize if I'm saying the obvious. You know, in the case of Holocaust survivors, there were also adult survivors that we all somehow knew because it was more or less in the recent past. In the case of Armenian survivors, those of us who, you know, whether they were our grandmothers or, or they were child survivors. So their memories of place of birth and all of the other things that give you roots were gone. So when Arsina says, I have no way of going back, she has no way of going back. Well, my grandfather from my mother's side was five years old. He only remembered his first name, Aristakis. So that when they asked him, uh, what's your name? He said, I don't know. I know my name. And they said, okay, what was the name of your brother? He said, Nishan. Eventually he called my uncle Nishan. And what was the name of your sister? He said, Mari. He eventually called his daughter Mari, my aunt Mari. All of my grandfather's children were named after his brothers and sisters. But he didn't know his last name. So they had to give him a last name. This is in an orphanage in Beirut. They said, so what did your father do? He said, mm, I don't know. I think he sold uh, leather, something with leather. They said, okay, we're going to call you Goshkaryan, which means shoemaker. So we became Goshkaryan. So even my family name from my mother's side is not my real name. So if I'm going to go and try to find out if there are any survivors at all, but in the case of my grandfather, he saw the whole family slaughtered. So uh, I wouldn't be able to. So I wouldn't know. To talk, and I'm still struggling with the microphone. Well, I really like storytelling, so I have one more story for you. It was about two years ago. I was, you know, painting my house, and we got the painter in my house, and there were these young guys who came along with the painter, and they were painting the rooms. And then I realized that the painter uh, was looking at my book. I mean, they were somehow interested in that. And then, I mean, when they finished painting, I told them, look, this is the book I wrote about my grandmother, so that's your copy. And then, you know, they left, and we had a problem with the floor, with the neighbor, we had a problem with the bathroom, uh, and all the good work of painting they did that was destroyed. So I called the painter again so that he would come and fix the problem. And like I called him, and he said, on Friday, I will come and I will fix it. And I said, no way, on Friday I have some guests and I, I'm, I invited them for dinner, so I can't make it. And he said, no worries, we'll come at three, we'll finish it now, two hours, and everything will be fine. And I came home. He was not there. I realized they came. They painted the wall again, and they left. Everything was in good shape. But then I found something else. My whole kitchen was full of all meze, appetizers, meatballs, everything. It was full of food. It was like a feast. And I asked, how come? And they said, Ahmet Usta, the painter, took it. And I called him, Ahmet Usta, what is this? Ah, you told me that you're... You know, you're expecting some guests. And I said, come on, it was my guest. And then he said, you know what? I read this book. No matter what we do, you would not be able to forget us. We will not be forgotten. We are not to be forgiven. 
I could go to the US when I lost my grandmother. So together with my cousin, the first thing I did was to go to the cemetery of my grandmother's mother and father. I had two roses in my hand. And as I was laying those roses on the graveyard, I kneeled down. And in Turkish, I said the following on my personal behalf and on behalf of all these people who made this to you, I apologize. And then Aunt Mary told me, what did you say? Because I was speaking in Turkish and they didn't understand and my friend translated for me. And Aunt Mary said, well, but you're not guilty. Yes, maybe we don't carry the direct responsibility, but for about a century, we are living with denial policy and with the policy of silence. So that's where our guilt comes into play. So we are guilty of the silence and denial. But unfortunately, we as a third and fourth generation, we can't change this history. We can't change what happened in the past. But in the future, what will happen? We are really thinking a lot what will happen in the future, and that's the reason why I believe it is quite useful for us to, to talk to each other so that we have a better future. So thank you very much for everything. You cannot change the past, neither can I, but we can change the future. And I think you said something at the very beginning of uh, your uh, words. You said, if she wasn't my grandmother, maybe I wouldn't believe her. So this is a very interesting uh, thing to say because you then later on, because she was your grandmother, you believed her. And there are two million people out there who have grandmothers. And if all of you do believe what has happened, maybe you can bring a change, which is all, all the more important for you uh, and very important also for us, the survivors of, of the genocide itself. But I would like to read this passage, which was the passage, Salpi, when she said uh, we were gonna do the interview, she said, Arsene, you're gonna cry your eyes out, hünkür hünkür. And I said, uh, okay, and I started reading the book, but I think I was very reticent, I didn't want to cry. I thought I'm gonna read this as objectively as I can. But when I came to this one passage, it says, the same day we went to New Jersey to visit my grandmother's parents' grave. I wanted to buy flowers, but it was early evening and most florists were shot. Of the flowers I was able to find, the best were pink roses, and I bought two bouquets. Hovannes and Iskui were buried, buried in the same grave. As I put the roses on the gravestone, I ask for absolution from my grandmother and all her family in my name and in the names of those who had brought about their unspeakable pain. And this is what we need to have recognized. This is what you will be able to do when you ba go back to Turkey. Because from the outside, we have done and we have tried everything we can sometimes foolishly, a lot of times very honestly, but it seems now the ball is in your court. You're gonna have to carry that work, uh, perhaps at a big price, but fear is no explanation. I'm so sorry, Salpi. I'm very sorry for pushing the limits of your patience, but I have to say this. But please, take also this into account that now in Turkey there are so many people who came to be so curious about their family's history. It's so incredible. There are plenty of people who are now trying to find out their family stories. I mean, they stop me on the streets. You know, they're also struggling to find out what happened to their families. I get calls about it. So this curiosity of family stories is something very important because we are all 
imposed, you know, to believe in one identity like Muslim, Turk. So now they know this is not only the case. Now maybe they will just find out that their grandfathers are actually Armenian or Greeks. Another ethnic identity that they were taught as enemies. So once you find out about your family identity, you can't be enemies any longer. Let me just finish with a very funny note. I was in the uh, courthouse and a young lawyer came to me. The very you know, I was really looking and looking, looking, but I couldn't find anyone in my family. <laughs> I don't just want to say thank you. I want to say um, congratulations because you are helping us break down the wall of silence. I was just telling Daniela and Anne of the Nauman Foundation uh, Stiftung that um, f about 15 years ago here in Germany, uh, Dorothe Forma, a Dutch filmmaker, made a film about Vahakan Dadrian, an Armenian historian, and Taner Akcam, a Turkish historian, who were working together uh, to try to break some walls. And she called the film The Wall of Silence. Mm -hmm. And that was 15 years ago, just about, maybe a little more. And today, we are helping to break down that wall. Um, I don't know where the responsibility lies to push this process along, but I know that our responsibility as institutions around the world, especially in the Caucasus, especially in Armenia and Turkey, but also in Europe, is to give resonance to what begins as a sharing of the pain and hopefully will move on to collaborative ef efforts that can only benefit all of us. Thank you again for supporting this and for sharing in this. Thank you.